Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1975 Italian giallo film, The Suspicious Death of a Minor, and I watched it on an Arrow Blu-ray. Um, looks really good, as you would assume from something from Arrow. Uh, this actually is a version that has Blu-ray and DVD, I guess because it came out during that time when they were, you know, kind of trying to bridge the gap, I assume. But uh, yeah, this is a Sergio Martino film. Uh, if you have interest in Giallo in general, I have a lot of Giallo reviews on my channel. I have an entire playlist for Giallo film reviews. I also have an entire playlist for just Sergio Martino films as well, because I've reviewed a bunch of his as well. So this isn't my favorite. Suspicious Death of a Minor is not my favorite Martino film, but I found it entertaining. It's also, you know, not towards the higher rankings of Giallo films I've seen. It's probably more towards the middle-ish or lower middle, um, but it's still entertaining. It's definitely worth watching. I enjoyed it well enough. So, like I said, directed by Sergio Martino, some other films you know, well, potentially would know of his. Uh, Your Vice is a locked room and only I have the key, which actually there's a poster that shows up in the film, if you notice, for that film. Uh, when they eventually go to the theater that for some odd reason has like this opening ceiling i don't know if that was actually a thing back then in italy but you can let me know in the comments if you find that information uh but yeah when when they go to the to that theater um they show a really close up shot of kind of like the keyhole picture with someone like screaming inside of it from the poster that is your vice uh your vice is a locked room and only i have the key which martino did uh, he also did films All the Colors of the Dark, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, which is probably my favorite of his films, Torso, The Case of the Scorpion's Tail, The Scorpion with Two Tails, and American Rickshaw, which, by the way, I have American Rickshaw in this pile up here that I need to watch, and will be watching relatively soon. Written by Martino and Ernesto Gastaldi. Uh, now, you may know that name, especially if you've been watching a bunch of my review videos for Giallo films. Uh, Gastaldi's been involved with scripts for The Vampire and The Ballerina, Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory, The Whip in the Body, The Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key, All the Colors of the Dark, The Case of the Bloody Iris, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, Torso, The Forbidden Photos of a Lady Above Suspicion, The Scorpion with Two Tails, The Case of the Scorpion's Tail, and Death Walks on High Heels. Now, that's just some of the films. Now, Gastaldi did a lot of writing, but I was just trying to name more you know, horror and giallo films. So just know that. So apparently Gastaldi said in an interview about this film that he didn't think it was that all that great and he just felt like Martino wasn't really able to, like, work his magic on the film. Now, I don't know if that was kind of like a deflecting that he was doing because the story's not the best. I really kind of feel like Martino did what he could with that, to be honest. Because from a directorial and cinematography standpoint, I think it actually looks good. And there's a lot of interesting camera movement. There's a lot of interesting shots. The way the camera moves with the characters, because there's a lot of movement in this film. I mean, one one of the parts that really comes to mind for me, it's a very engaging, is when they're following, um, after the, <laughs> the shootout on the roller coaster at that carnival, then it goes to the subway. And they sh they're like, the camera's following one of the guys running who then like jumps the turnstile and then they kind of like stop there. But, th but that kind of like following movement, um, I think I, I'm just pointing to that to say those types of things in this film, Martino did what he could. I think this is kind of Gestaldi trying to deflect a little bit that the story wasn't that great because the story is not that great, honestly. <laughs> um, uh, Luciano Michelini actually did all the music for this, and I will say that, by and large, the music is not that good, in my opinion. That is one of the biggest problems, especially, like, I don't want to say it's, like, a Benny Hill-type song, if you know who I'm talking about and what I'm talking about, but, like, there's kind of this Benny Hill-type song that's, like, a little too light, a little too goofy and wacky that plays numerous times in the film that I feel really takes away from the tension and, I don't know, just being interested in the film. It's a weird song. It's weird types of music, but the uh, theme song, like the intro song that actually shows up a few other times in the film, I think sounds really good because it sounds very Goblin-esque. I don't know if people agree with me on that one, but I really do like that particular song. But other than that, not a great score. Uh, this film is also called Too Young to Die, which 
makes sense. I, I like this title a lot better. It's just more interesting, and it's more Giallo-like, if you know what I mean. So, in the beginning of this film, no mystery what the killer looks like, as he is shown very much so when he is stabbing Marissa, uh, or I'm sorry, Marisa. Um, I mean, yes, they're not showing his eyes because he has those super reflective sunglasses, but the point ends up being th with this, not who the actual killer is, but who is kind of motivating the killer at that point. And that's kind of what I assumed when I first saw that they were showing the face of the actual guy doing the stabbing and throat slitting. So, um, you know, not your typical giallo in that sense. Uh, another way that it's not your typical giallo is it's very focused on action. I've never seen a giallo film this focused on action and chases. Um, I think it's the case... No, it wasn't the case of Bloody Iris. Uh, Black Belly of the Tarantula. There is a significant chase scene in that, but this kind of takes that and then just goes, like, way further. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've never seen this type of action in a um, giallo. It's like Beverly Hill Cops giallo, you know? You get the idea the town where the murder happened is shady, as the guy on the motorcycle steals a uh, briefcase from the cops, and Carmen the prostitute laughs at them and makes fun. Uh, they they do a good job of, of kind of making it seem like the cops shouldn't be that surprised that Marisa got killed there, because A, where she gets killed is a house of ill repute, a.k.a. a brothel, a.k.a. a house of prostitutes, a.k.a. a whorehouse. Anything you want to say, uh, that's where it happens, and you and you do get that idea that not only is that going on, but then Giannino, who you find out who he is later, goes by and steals from the police, which, that's brazen. That is obviously very brazen, and I feel like that's in the script to kind of show you what a bad side of the town this is, that someone's that brazen to just steal from the cops. But then again, this does kind of fall into the whole um, trope that you have a lot in Giallo films, where it's kind of like the cops are stupid. Obviously, other than Detective Paolo, who is the smartest guy ever, but is also extremely questionable in his actions and how he acts towards people as a man of the law. I understand he was in an unofficial capacity doing his work, but um, very questionable guy. Uh, but that's part of the fun. Why is Paolo strangling this woman with a gun to her head? He could try asking her some questions first. That is the woman who was uh, answering the phone at the brothel, who I guess saw Marisa run up before she was killed. Um, he just gets really violent with her, like immediately. Like he starts strangling her, he's holding a gun to her head, and then he starts asking her questions, basically. So you see his methods very early on, because this is very early on. He's brutal. He doesn't really care. He's just going to get results. Like, that's his main drive. He doesn't care who he hurts, what he destroys in the meantime, or how many people die, to be honest, because people end up dying while he's doing his work. Uh, he just cares about results. So odd when Paolo gets Giannino to join him in stealing purses from prostitutes. Then it turns into a straight-up comedy, especially because of that zany piano music that I was referencing earlier. Uh, that whole sequence where he's stealing all these purses while, you know, Giannino's on the back of the motorcycle and Paolo's driving it, and he's just, like, snatching purses because he wants to find out who Menga is, so he's trying to look at their IDs later and tells Giannino he can keep all the money, which is obviously what he's interested in. But when they kind of get caught, people are, like, hitting him and slapping him and stuff, and it's just, like, that zany, like, piano music, which, Benny Hill-ish, if you know what I mean. Paolo putting in the detective work but not letting his money go to waste with the prostitute he hires, Carla. Uh, when he gets some information from her, he pays her. He acts like he's a John, basically, and he's going to pay her for sex. And then he gets this information, and he's just like, oh, well, that's basically all I want. And he's like, but I'm not going to let this money go to waste. Let's uh, get it on. And he does. And that further lets you know who he really is as a person. Not, not a squeaky clean uh, man of the law. I wasn't sure Paolo's car would make it through the whole film. It's a real beater. Uh, and it didn't. It actually got replaced after he got that money from Pesce, uh, or Pesci, um, the banker guy, who ended up being the dude behind it all in the end, obviously. 
Nice trick with the unsigned check and following Floriana to Manga's place. I feel like the sequence following her is where the film actually really started to pick up. Prior to that, it was a little bit slow. It was a little bit meandering. You didn't really know what it was doing. But as soon as he plays that trick on Floriana with the unsigned check, because her fault for not checking it, and then Manga starts like beating her because of it, um, that it's taking the mystery somewhere. You know, it's like, okay, now we're hitting the ground, really. We're really going somewhere. I feel like we're going to start getting pieces of the actual puzzle at this point. Paolo is so brash. Lo love how he has a Coke and watches TV at Menga's place after he killed him. So Menga killed Floriana accidentally, and then <laughs> Paolo killed Menga and then just drags their bodies into another room, goes and gets a a Coca-Cola from the refrigerator sits down and starts watching TV while drinking a Coke. Like, it just goes into this dude's psyche of just like, he doesn't care. He does not care. He just wanted to take a load off. But I think, oh, I think that could actually partially be because he was waiting to see if the ransom money was going to end up showing up, which it did. You realize pretty quick they use the typical incompetent police trope. I already talked about that. It's so wacky when Giannino is throwing the car doors at the cop car as Paolo drives. In general, the car chase scene is extremely wacky, especially with the music they used, and it's a very, very long scene. That was a super long car chase scene, but you have all these things happening, like all the car doors being thrown, which is just very over-the-top wacky weird with that weird wacky music, and then like the guy who almost gets hit, hit by the car and he's like spinning around on the ground and then it happens again and then the nuns in the car and it's just it's too much it's too much like kind of like a slapsticky comedy type thing and that's not really what this film is about um I feel like you can have kind of like a funny moment here or there if you want but when you're doing that it's it's too much now I don't know if that was all scripted stuff or maybe Martino did come up with that stuff while on the set. I don't know. But that stuff wasn't very good. I don't feel like it meshed with the film. Glad that it finally makes sense why Paolo was with Marisa in the very beginning of the film. Uh, he was working the kidnapping case unofficially, as I said. Um, yeah, because it starts with him running into her and having that dance with her. And... Um, you're just like, okay, like, why is he there at that point? Especially for someone who's going to end up being killed. And then you find out he's a detective. So you eventually find out he was already kind of work, unofficially working this case, and Marisa had some information that had to do with that young boy who had been kidnapped, and his parents paid the ransom, but then they didn't want to talk about anything having to do with it. And apparently that was a whole pattern that kept happening. They sure cover a lot of area in the film uh, because there are a lot of chases in it. Uh, there's even the roller coaster shootout that ends up on the subway tracks, which that was probably my favorite part of the film. I really enjoy that. Um, it's nuts. I mean, who thinks of having a shootout go on on a roller coaster? I think it's a crazy idea, but I think it's cool. And then the fact that it, it, you know, they're running after each other and it goes into the subway. And like I said, the guy like jumps the turnstile while the camera's following him. And then he gets taken out by a subway. You don't see any viscera from it which I wish you did, but that's the idea, is that he gets kind of, his body gets crushed and swept away by the subway. Paolo's glasses continually getting cracked is kind of a dumb callback joke. They did that, what, three times in the film? I just felt like it was just, it was a little too forced. It wasn't very interesting. It wasn't funny. It was just a thing. Man, Paolo is real rough with Carla. I know it seems like she screwed him over on some information, but he threatens to break her ankle. Just another thing pointing to how outside of the law <laughs> Paolo actually operates within this film. Uh, when he goes to Carla and he's like, You're, you know, the information wasn't good. Are you trying to screw me over? And he's like literally throws her on the bed and like grabs her ankle and talks about, well, maybe you do better with a broken ankle. And it's just like, dude, calm down. Calm down. Ooh. But, you, you know, you do see throughout the film that they're, they're interested in kind of throwing the book at him, the regular police officers are, but then there's that little group that's kind of wants to protect him because they're like, no, we need him to do the dirty work. He's doing the unofficial investigation. We need it that way. 
Um, once the landlady is stabbed to death, uh, you get the idea the killer is a hired blade and whatever information Marisa had is the key to the mystery. Yes, very much what ends up happening. And that's kind of the point where you get that idea once that landlady is stabbed. Which, by the way, on internetmoviedatabase.com, IMDb. Sorry, I don't know why I said it all the way out. Everyone knows what that means. Um, she is actually in the credits as landlady. That's it. Just landlady. She couldn't even get a name. That's how you know she's probably going to die. How about the detail of all the saliva coming out of Carla's mouth when she gets strangled? I really didn't see it uh, coming because how often do you see that? I've seen so many films, especially horror films, where people get strangled to death, but they never have that detail of like just saliva falling out of the person's mouth. That's more natural. It's more visceral. It's more disturbing, in my opinion. And I actually like that touch to Carla's death. Um, and I was surprised, once again, because you don't see that, that level of detail usually. Note that when Giannino goes to the theater, they show a poster for Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key. I already talked about that. And what what is, again, what is with the opening roof on the theater? Like, I liked the aspect of, the, you know, the chase going up to the rooftop. Yet another chase in this film. The chase going up to the rooftop and then the rooftop opening and the guy, like, falling through. But, once again, is that a thing? Like, was that a thing? I don't know. It just seems like something they just created because that's what they wanted to do in the film. Which is fine. I just want to know if that was a thing. Cool shot through Paolo's new glasses. Um, it actually has to be really hard to change the focus that fast. When he finally gets his new glasses because he got the money from Pesci, the banker Pesci. Um, and it's it starts with the shot through one of his lenses of the new glasses. And it's out of focus because it's focusing on the glasses and then he takes it down and it immediately focuses on the guy behind it. That quick focus change had to be very tough. And it's a cool shot. It's a very cool shot. Looks good. Now, uh, wow, <laughs> what a moment when Gloria opens the exploding package when she's on the back of Giannino's motorcycle. I definitely did not see that coming. I thought maybe it would be a bomb, but I thought it would like fizzle out or she would throw it last minute because they'd hear it making some sort of noise. I didn't th think the motorcycle would just explode in grand fashion like that, but I'm glad it did because that's another really good part of the film. It's a great scene, especially because it is so surprising and brutal, very brutal. Shooting a scene on the car train was very interesting. That's another thing. I didn't even know those things existed either. Um, the fact that you they, they have train cars that are basically cages that you can drive a car up onto and then they just take it with it. That was nuts to me. I was like, this is cool. So I love the fact that they incorporated that. And the whole scene with, you know, Paolo getting out of his car and going over and getting in the car of uh, Pesci. Well, kills his driver first and then getting in the car with Pesci. And then that's where the final confrontation goes down. Uh, it was good. It was a good scene. The ending does feel pretty anticlimactic. And I wish the mystery was a bit more interesting. That's what I was talking about with the, the story not being the greatest. I guess the big shock was supposed to be the minors being prostitutes and Pesci sexually abusing his niece and her friends while giving them coke. Now, when I say it like that, it does sound very interesting, but the way it ends up being presented and so slowly within the film really is not that interesting. Um, they could have revealed it in a more shocking way, but I don't know. It just, it, it makes it feel like the film was building towards something and then it kind of fizzles out in the end. Now, maybe other people feel differently, but you can let me know in the comments. I, um, like I said, though, I still enjoyed this film. I still had a good time with it. I like how Martino structures a bunch of his shots around the architecture uh, at his shooting locations. Uh, following people up and down stairs, he did a bunch of that type stuff. That's a cool way to, like, really open the scene up, make it feel bigger, make it feel more engaging and interesting. And, like, the audience can kind of see more of the cityscape and what's going on. It makes it feel more of a grand film, especially with all these chase scenes like I was talking about. In general, I dig Martino's style, and that's one thing that keeps this film engaging. Nice directing and cinematography with interesting angles and interesting camera movements. Like I was saying, Gestaldi saying that Martino didn't pull it off, I don't really think so. I really do think that Martino did, maybe not everything he could have done with this, but he did a good job, I really feel like. So, 
I think a lot of it's with the story, Gestaldi. I'm just saying. Anyway, what am I going to rate this out of five stars with half stars in play? I'm going to give a solid three star rating. Um, it's good, not great. Wanted a little bit more from it, but I, was, I will still watch it again because obviously I own it now, especially. So, uh, what did you think about this film? If you've seen it, go ahead and put it down in the comments. We can get nerdy about this or just any Giallo in general. I am down to talk about it because obviously I'm super nerdy about Giallo. I think this is my 48th giallo film review uh video that i'm putting up gonna be hitting 50 pretty soon and i'm going to keep going after that uh i'm gonna try and get as comprehensive as possible with giallo so thank you for checking this out do me a quick favor though hit that subscribe button if you haven't already if you have i thank you very much and i probably have visually and mentally thanked you because every time i get a new subscriber i get an email telling me who has subscribed and i look at your profile and i say that is awesome. Thank you to that person. Because it really does keep me motivated to keep doing these reviews. Because sometimes when you just, you know, throw stuff out there and you're like, maybe people are consuming it. Maybe people aren't. It's It seems like, what am I doing? But when, you, you know, people are commenting and I'm getting new subscribers and I'm just like, okay, cool. Like, someone's actually watching it and appreciating it. That makes me want to do more. So please help me out with that. Also, hit the notification bell button because that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos, whether it's a in-depth film review like this one or one of my no-spoiler ones or a haul video, unboxing, any of that jazz. But regardless, I really do thank you for taking your time to watch this. It really does mean a lot to me. And until next time, keep it brutal.